Good evening, 7 o'clock, we have a quorum. We'll call the planning board meeting to order. First up for general information is Mark Reed. Good evening. Good evening. Mark Reed from Heritage Surveys. Um, with me tonight is Bill Cannon. We have a, we'd like to meet with the board as a pre-permitting step for a project that is going to be constructed <coughs> on the last lot on Venture Way. Well, there's one left? I thought they were all done. Yeah, this last one. Oh, okay. The last one. <laughs> I thought they were all taken, that's why. Yeah, right. Okay. So, um, this is a schematic plan that we produced. The building in itself. Got it. Got it. Um, the building in itself is going to be constructed in phases, so the first part of the building is 39,000 square feet, and then the second part of the kind of an L-shaped building is uh, 4,430 square feet. Uh, so that the client is Desco um, Medical. They service medical equipment, and I have a little narrative that was prepared by them to give to the board. So that Tesco um, is only going to have four full-time employees at this facility. Uh, the rest of the people who work out in the field, they go into medical facilities, hospitals, doctor's office, and so forth. Um, and the building for you know use intensity-wise is very low-key. And so um, as far as the front portion of the building are still retained. So is it going to be kind of a warehouse? You got four employees with a building this? Yeah, it's going to be office space and they, you know, they they hope to be able to grow. So is this whole building will be de will be Desco? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the first phase of the, of the third, excuse me, 39, right? Uh, the, the architectural arrangement of the building is such that uh, Desco um, is going to lease out portions of this building to other tenants as well. So it won't just be them uh, that is coming into this building in here, uh, okay. but there'll be uh, there's room for other tenants as well. So in the, in the first phase uh, of the building, which is the front portion, uh, they will occupy about half of it and then lease out the other half to another potential tenant. And then the second phase, which is the wing going back, this uh, will be divided into uh, two tenants at the most. Um, you know, if, if such that there's a tenant that needs more square footage, um, that can be uh, arranged uh, with uh, Desco and modified according to their needs. But all the parking and everything else will meet the requirements for you know the the uh, building size. Just, just be aware that because you're in the aquifer, that, that any any tenant would have to be come. You have to let us know what tenant is going to be and what they do. Okay, correct. Yeah, right. it's it's all it's all office, office. space though per yeah. se. Well, it's and, not and I'm not saying it's a problem. I'm just as, as as a matter of the bylaw, that's what you got to do. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Most, I mean, we have not seen an issue with anybody that's done that. Right. Okay. Right. So this this piece is a 13 acre piece. Uh, what's going to be developed is about two acres out of the 13. Uh, the rest of it's going to be remain as current condition, uh, open space. There's a couple, of, there's detention basins, three different detention basins that were constructed on this piece of property and associate, associated with uh, Venture Way as part of the original master plan that was done. For the exactly property. where it, where is it? Uh, so it's, I got all the locus here. Yeah, I got an overall plan. So, so this is right next to the pump station. Okay. All right. So, American River is on the inside of it. Um, the Pearson. And uh, yes, the educational. Educational building yep. is over here. Um, then UMass also has another building on that side. Which one was just sold? Uh, well, Over here, part of it. In the end, UMass? Yes, yeah, so it was sold to UMass, or to the Commonwealth, to the UMass for so their library. That becomes a non tax bank for us to know? Um, <laughs> I would guess so, yes. Yeah. There's two buildings on that piece. 
Uh, as you're facing the property, the left hand building, um, UMass has bought. The right hand is still owned by Pearson. Okay. Um, on that piece of property. So there are wetlands on the property. Um, the, the wetland boundaries have been confirmed by the Conservation Commission, and we are preparing a notice of intent to be filed with them too. Timeline? Timeline, we, we'd like to file uh, the application for your first meeting in February. Um, only, if you're ready to, only if you have everything tonight. Yep. I mean, no, no get it in. To oh, apply. apply. Oh, I'm sorry, apply. Yeah, to apply. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Apply yeah. in your, I think it's uh, February 5th, I believe, or whatever, first whatever, day, whatever, whatever that date is. is. Right. And then uh, we, okay. And then go through the process from that. Okay. Um, so if you apply to yeah. so are, are you got, if you got in here and review and everything else would, would be lined up? Um, we don't have anyone yet. Okay. The question is who, you know, who would you like? You did, it's who, you whoever. Did, we, we, we have a list of uh, several. Yep. And you can pick one of them okay. and deal directly with them. We don't want to be involved in, we don't want to be a middleman. We just want to see a final end product that sure. says we're all, sure. you're all set. Yep. Okay. okay. Um, I assume, you know, I know that we have to go through site plan review. Yes. And special <coughs> permit. You got site plan review, yep. site plan approval, um, special permit for active for use. Yep. And probably because you're disturbing more than 40,000 square feet of soil, that's a, right. kind of a, a minor thing, but you know, that's through that, that storm that's water. Through the stormwater thing. Correct. But basically, you know, it's a, uh, oh. MH, 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 MS4. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, so. um, so those don't do Correct. So if you were to file on February 5th, mm -hmm. we would normally schedule you for March 5th, but we've been trying for the public hearing. Okay. But we have been trying to keep the first Tuesday open for um, planning, that we consult with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Okay. So we, I, I'd say we'd probably be looking at a public hearing for like March 19th. Yeah. Okay, public and, hearing and, on the and, 19th. If you have, have you got all your plans ready yet? We're, we're about seventy-five percent complete. Okay, I'm, I'm, and from so. what from what you're saying, you might have a difficult time getting a reviewing engineer to get everything done in four weeks. Oh yes, we we understand that. So that way, if you apply between now and for and March nineteenth, yep. or March eighteenth, actually, yep. um, you know, get get everything addressed. That would work fine. You okay. can you can reach out to the. Um, uh, peer review engineers anytime. You don't have to wait until you file. Okay. Yeah, All yeah right. that's true. So um, well, we, can, we can do that. Okay. If you want to send me an email at uh, planning at yep. EMA, yep. I'll send you the peer review right. list. Yeah, we went through that with, you know, American River across the street. Okay. So. Oh, you haven't. So. It hasn't changed since then. Yeah. Uh, I'll okay. send you another copy if you can't find that one. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Do you have a copy of, the app of, that, of an application? Um... I do not. So just file. Good. Thank you. you have, have a couple copies of that. I'll yep. sign one. Bring up with the town clerk. And it's a basic stuff. You yes. have the address for contacts. Uh, filing fee? It would be for a. How big is the total building? So the total building is is just on eighty three about eighty three eighty thousand three hundred fifty nine square feet. Yeah. Eighty four hundred square feet. Total. Yeah. Total. So we don't handle the money anyway. Right. So right. But you want you want to be ready. Okay, I understand yeah. that. Uh, let me see. You eighty said eighty four hundred square feet? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Pardon? Eighty four thousand. No, 8,359. Yeah, 8,400 square feet. Yeah, 84,000 would be two, yeah. two, two plus acres. That's yeah. a yeah. Yeah. building, yeah. yeah. Um, your filing fee is going to be roughly 350 bucks. Okay. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I, I, Ruff, roughly $350. Yeah. I, you know, in that way. I'll give you an exact date when you, when you, when yeah, you bring the form in, but it's going to be in that range. It's not yeah. going to be. Okay. You know, the one that you pay for okay. Great. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. See you then. Yep. Carlos. Yes. Neto. 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 Yes. Neto.
My name is Carlos Nieto, I'm a landscape architect with the Berkshire Design Group, and we are here in front of you for uh, application for the SEPA review of the uh, North Hadley fire substation um, that we're doing for the town of Hadley. Um, I have application, nine application uh, packets and uh, plans with me. Um, and just to give you a quick description of what uh, we are proposing, uh, the site is um, off of, of uh, River Drive, and the north part of River Drive, uh, intersection with Stockbridge Road, which is what you're seeing here. Uh, it's a total of nine acre parcel. You're, the drawing here, just to be able to see the details, doesn't show the rest of the parcel. There's a survey, full survey of the parcel included in the package, so you can see the rest of the parcel. You got enough parking? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. What, what is the uh, boundary? How far are you from that, the old tobacco barn? Um, we are farther than, I would say, almost 400 feet or so, or more, uh, from the tobacco barn. This is about 100 and yeah. almost 180 feet, and we are probably twice the distance. I can pull out a plan and show you no, that's the that's plan. Fine. We don't need that. Okay, yeah. Um, and it's all, it, it, again, in the plans. Uh, the size of the uh, building itself is around 5,300 square feet. Um, we are looking at uh, uh, two curb cuts, one 24-foot curb cut and a 37-foot uh, curb cut, but uh, that will serve the base and the 24-foot curb cut is to separate the two uses, emergency use and, and then the general parking for people who are going to be coming here. Okay. Um, it, again, parking bays, uh, we have some um, uh, screening plantings for the parking so that it's screened from the street uh, per the regulations. Um, the whole site is going to be, uh, drainage wise, it's going to be sheet flowing so we don't have any catch basins. It's going to go into a very shallow uh, infiltration pond that's going to uh, be there. So we are expecting all the drainage for the site to be basically handled in the site with an overflow that will go to municipal uh, in events of very high high uh, rainfall. It will go where? Uh, to the municipal system. There's a catch basin right here. We have an overflow. Uh, we, we typically don't allow you that out of the municipal system. A as a no overflow. So we're handling all the water. We have a full uh, drainage report that you will see. We're handling all the water on site, but there's always a, a fail safe, an overflow that we normally propose. So well, who, who, who's, who's the engineer? Who's doing the review on this? Um, Mod McDonald is doing the peer review. Who? Mott McDonald. Oh, Mott McDonald. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that. Yeah. Usually the uh, the. They do not the town. Uh, what, what, what's your, what's your, what is the drainage system being designed for? What year storm? Oh, for a two-year storm. No, no. What, what's the peak? What's the, what's, the, what's the storm being? What, what the twenty-five year storm, hundred year storm? A hundred year. I believe it's up to. I mean, I, I would refer that to our engineer, who is the one who did all the calculations, and he's going over um, through your your regulations. So he's de designing to that. I, I believe it's I believe it's a ten year storm that he's modeling for for the smallest the most frequent storm that he's modeling for. Okay, and he it goes, needs to be a minimum. 25 year storm. Mm -hmm. Let him know that. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm 99 percent sure that he's gone through that uh, in okay. the report. Um, Just who, who, curiosity. I mean, yeah. this is a, a big parcel, and mm -hmm. it seems like you're putting this right in the middle, so it kind of eliminates any other possibilities for expansion for some other town building. So we've set back. It, there is actually more space on the on the right side than on the left. So it's not. Exactly right well, in the middle, well, but but there I is. Know, but I understand what you're saying. There's some space here. There is a a, a, a existing knoll or a, yeah. a, a elevation that we have in here, and we were um, the idea of having the building here. First of all, is to have some uh, some separation from the abutters on on one side. So that's why we are not on top of the knoll because we will be higher. Um, and then we did not put the building farther to the right because this is lower. Um, so we wanted to, the building to be not on the top of the knoll, but not on the lowest point of, this, of the parcel where you could have some issues with drainage. So that, that's the lo logic of the location. Um, there was a request to have the 
uh, public entrance or the that was my next question. Uh, public entrance just right uh, across from Stockbridge Road, just to to create a an, a good intersection. Yeah. Um, so that's also one of the reasons why that that is there. And then if we were to move this and wanting to have this uh, somewhere else, if we flipped it or did anything else, we would start using more much more land and, and more, more paving. So that that's the reasoning why this is located where it is. Okay. Okay. What's well, going to be to the east where you've just got it all gray there? Th this the back. Oh, the back. It's just I mean, the west, parcel. Excuse me, west. Yeah. The west. The parcel is going to stay uh, as it is right now. Uh, there might be some future plans for for the rest of the parcel, but as of right now, it's just going to stay as agricultural fields, or as fields, open fields. Okay. Um, and the extent of the actual work itself is pretty much what you're seeing on the green. How big of how big of an area is that? It's less than uh, about two acres, okay. one point ninety eight okay. of an acre. So, so um, there are some uh, resource areas outside of the work area uh, that we did an RDA with uh, Conservation Commission to make sure that they understood that we were doing work outside of that area. So that's been already done. In your calculations for the drainage, uh, in as much as there's a knoll and the water's going to run certainly to the south, <laughs> and uh, are you calculating that into your drainage? as well or just the, just the part that's in light green well it's it's a part that we are developing because you you look at pre-development and post-development of the site so and then there's a comparison between the two but the natural topography is such that the water is going to drain from the knoll down into that property so well we've elevated i mean the 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 building is elevated enough that the water will will sheet flow away from it okay. from one side and from the other and the, it's lower, sorry, it's lower towards, well, so, and I think I, that'll okay. be so make Those it, are all uh, questions for the public hearing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. We're not trying to analyze it tonight. We're just trying to get basic information. The topography is lower on the No, but before too. they I, go I, ahead with all the engineering studies, they, this is certain questions we're going to ask. Yes. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So the topography is actually lower on the west side, so on the back side of this. So the water actually moves okay. towards the back. You have, you have an application for us? Yes, I have everything. Nineteen. Yeah, if they're ready. So that's application page. Yep. Then we have I have two copies of the storm drainage report. Okay. Full copies, and then there's nine copies of basically the. Uh, it also has a copy of the application and extra materials and descriptions of the project. Okay. And overall, and then these are two copies of the uh, labels, and then 20, enough uh, envelopes to, to for the mailings. Yeah, I'll make a motion to waive the filing fee for a municipal project. Okay, second. I'm just a motion uh, second to waive filing fee. All in okay. favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes four zero one absent. Now, when who do I give these two to get stamps put on them? And who do I give? Because we're going to waive all fees, okay. somebody's going to be paying for the legal notices okay. and for the stamps for this, and not the planning board. Okay. That we normally pay for. Okay. So who do I contact to give that stuff to? You can contact me. Okay. So when I get this ready to be mailed, I give them to you. Perfect. And when I get the invoice for the uh, Daily Hampshire Gazette, I give that to you. Yes. And you'll get it taken care of. Yes. Okay. If you want to make sure before we get everything switches, <laughs> get that ahead of time. Right. If you want to dismiss this, in as much as the select board is here, it seems like a, a, it's certainly a big site for a little building, and there are have to be other plans. So you, is that going to be the main entrance if there are other buildings, and so that has to be worked into the system as well. In other words. It seems to be in the proper location that the Stockbridge intersection there, is. and uh, but is that road going to be sufficiently wide? Because obviously, the town owns the land; they're going to do something with it. Do you do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So uh, maybe wider intersection with a provider or something like that, or have the Ability to do it. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm sorry, Bill. You you were going to say. First 
the original package is there. I'm going to definitely go into more detail when we present this here. Hmm? We'll definitely go into more, more detail on these questions yeah, that you yeah, have, yeah. definitely, when, when we get to that point. Erosion and sediment control, not that one. Erosion and sediment control, that's what I'm looking for. Nine copies of the plans. Yeah, right. Put them on the tail end. Yeah, would you make sure, well actually would you make sure that one of them gets to the town clerk when you file the form? Perfect. So, so one of the nine? What you take one of the nine with you and give it to the town clerk when you file that application. Perfect. And then I will grab one of these. Yeah, you can take one of those. Yeah. Actually take one of the drainage reports too. Okay. Because I only need one drainage report. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Mr. Iser. Good evening, gentlemen. I have three items this evening. Item number one is Mr. Shumway's very small definitive subdivision final plan. Okay. The decision has been recorded in the registry, duly noted on this plan. The town clerk has signed off that the 20 day appeal period has passed. So we would just like that to be signed so that it can be recorded. here. They're going to cut the lot out right here. It's, uh, we're in the aquifer. We need 200 feet of frontage, 40,000 square feet. We have 200 feet of frontage and two and a half acres, so we have plenty of area to the adequate frontage. The 150-foot box fits in it. Will that perk? I believe they have perked it. Okay. Well, I know when they were looking to do this. This, well, oh, actually, the perk. This, this right here near the road perk. You're right. This, this was perkable back here is where they had the problem that it wouldn't perk. I, I, I think remember. Gone through all that process already. Okay. So, what street number are you giving this? No, it's the house is 103. Siago <coughs> is 111. I'm not giving it any number. I just for your okay. records, so you can. I don't know what the house number is going to be. Thank you. 
For Chimura Road, and this is going to be, this one's a little interesting in that it's somewhat complex. So I try to draw a color picture so you can understand what's going on. We're basically combining land from one lot into another. And I just wanted to help you understand what's going on. So the yellow is the land that's associated with 44 Chamorro Road. The owner of 44 Chamorro Road also happens to be the owner of 46 Chamorro Road. This was uh, Billy Grabiak's house and his uh, stepdaughter has bought that house and is selling her house and they're all moving in to this house. So we're cutting out the pink lot from 44 which leaves us the orange lot <laughs> that's going to get combined with the existing property at 46, which is then becoming the blue lot. A lot of what, stuff happening, but nothing. What's the full with the frontage on the pink lot? 191. Oh, that is, well, that, is, that, is, that is accurate, okay. Yeah, plus 40. Okay. And then you got the 150 foot box there. This, and you've got more than 40, you've got 52,000 square feet. So everything everything works according to the bylaw. And then what is your frontage for <clears throat> what is now the blue lot? That is 5789 plus 2748 and 2309. And I did put a note on here that this lot was previously approved as a flag lot. And this land has been combined with it since, and then we're just going to combine this with it now. Okay, so this does not have 200. 200. 200. Okay. I guess that is okay. And we're just increasing the footage of the pre existing flag lot, so. Two thirty-one fifty. Two thirty-one. Everything. Thirty-one fifty. 
230. Oh, plus this. 231.50 here. Right. 231.50. And 57.89. 27.48. Yep. 2309. Just too fun, too fast. 16. You got a better pen. This John Seibert pen doesn't have any ink in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't have any pen. Oh, Mr. Yeah. Water is the one that has an extra. Pass that yeah. down. And it's not even orange. He's going to steal it. So there's a way. So I bet you give it a spin the way we're going to go. I see you trust Mike more than Joe. That one's just as bad. It's just as dead. Yeah. Well, I'll use your one. Here. <laughs> Tell the board of selectors it's so cold in here, the pins don't wait. It's still cold. Operator error, never mind. <laughs> if Millie Fleabuck could see this skull, she'd turn over in a grave. I think. She was the fourth grade teacher that taught us penmanship. <laughs> Millie Fleabuck. Well, at least you yeah. got to learn it. You're not <laughs> teaching it anymore, apparently. Yeah. Hopefully, we get to do this. All right, that's all I have, gentlemen. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Explanation with a color rendering. Yes, that was much. Right. Thank you. Okay. Next, we will open the public hearing with Melissa Tess.
and for whatever reason, I forgot to bring, didn't get a copy in here with the uh, legal notice. Why, well, we'll just try to remember what, we, what the legal notice said, but the planning board will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, January 19th at 7.15 p.m. in the Senior Center for the application of Melissa Teft to a home occupation, home business at Stockbridge Street, and the home business is physiotherapy? Psychotherapy. Psychotherapy. Yes. Of course, psychotherapy. Wrong here. And uh, that's it. It was published twice in a newspaper. Um, Jan December 31st and January 7th, I believe, are the dates. Good. Okay. Go ahead. Let us know what you want to do. Oh, application is already in. Um, <clears throat> I uh, am a psychotherapist and have been for 32 years. I have an office in Northampton. And I wanted to move my office into Hadley, which is my town. And so I have an office space at home, um, which is um, on the first floor. And I've given you plans already and uh, a drawing of uh, um, the site. Um, there's park, there's a small area to park two cars. Um, I only see one person at a time. I see adults who are um, pretty high functioning. Um, uh, are just going through transitions in their lives, and I'm helping out with those transitions. Um, yeah. Just for me and for the audience, what exactly is a psychotherapy? Um, it's, it's like a, a psychologist, okay. so, uh, an LICSW. So I do counseling with people. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. How many anticipated patients a day would you think you'd be seeing? Um, I would see between six to eight. A day? Yeah. Every day? Yeah. Five days a week? Yeah, five days a week. My hours would be from eight to six, um, but there's flexibility in there. Uh, that's why they're so long. And so I maybe see 25, 28 people a week, um, depending on the week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Questions from the board? Are you young again? Or are you? <laughs> Neither. <laughs> what are you? Um, I would say uh, I specialize in transitions and grief. And I uh, work with people who have uh, been diagnosed with medical issues and are struggling with the transition in their life around that. Um, I also teach mindfulness-based stress reduction and have for about 20 years, so I deal with people who have really high stress and are trying to find ways to um, mitigate that and have higher quality of life. So you'll so. have no employees? No employees, solo practice, right. Yeah, and has been for many years, yeah. Any other questions? Questions in the audience? Most people are here for you. Big mailing list. I think there's four on the books. Three on the books. What's that? I said, I see you have a big abutters list. I think there was three or four abutters. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a uh, issue that was raised by the building inspector. Okay, by Tim. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Are you aware that apparently you have already built the addition? Yes, that's correct. But if the addition is to be used for commercial purposes, there might be alterations required into the building code. Right. And uh, I, I did, uh, Tim did talk with us about that. And I've been, um, my office in Northampton is on the third floor of Sylvester's Restaurant on Pleasant Street. And so I don't have um, uh, accessibility in that building. And so I've been renting space in town to um, have it be accessible for people with handicap or, or disability issues. And so uh, this is the woman that I currently rent space from. It's available on a regular basis. She, it, this building was renovated. It's the building right across the street from uh, um, the police station on Center Street. And uh, they have, uh, it's their two uh, handicapped bathrooms, an accessible room right inside the door. I see already a couple of clients there. So anybody who has that issue, I would see in Northampton. Okay. That, that's not an issue for us. Right. This is an issue for you and the building inspector that if he will allow that. Right. Okay. I think it's up to him. I'm not sure he can allow that. If you're putting in a new business, I believe you may have to make it handy. That's up to you. It's up to the building inspector and you as far as what the requirements of making it handicap accessible. Yeah. Just okay. want to be sure that the, you're aware of it. Oh, okay. The issue had percolated through. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so 
If I need to, I can talk with. That's the possibility of that, that, yes. that's out of our jurisdiction. Okay. All we're, right. We're basically making you aware of it. Okay. Full, Thank full you. catastrophe lives. Right. <laughs> well read. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good book. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So I will make a motion to grant the application for a home business special permit based upon the following findings. General conformity with the general purposes of the bylaw, not detrimental to the established or future character of the neighborhood. Um, there was no plan. It is a permit. Okay, it but it's it um, with, it'll be within the existing structure though. Yes. Right. Yep. And um, uh, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Right. And that means you you make your last appointment is enough before six, so yeah, that yeah. people vacate at six. Yeah, okay. yeah. Those are the kind of outside perimeters. Okay. Right. The uh, home business shall clearly be incidental and secondary as compared to the residential purposes of the property shall be conducted in such a manner just it does not give an outward appearance of a business expect, except as specifically allowed for signage and parking. One business per residential property, not more than 40% of the floor area. One sign not to exceed two square feet. Uh, you're not going to be offering incidental goods from sale. You're not creating goods. Uh, uh, Hours of operation, um, deliveries of products. You won't be getting deliveries of products. Uh, it's not an accessory structure. Uh, no obnoxious, toxic, or hazardous odors, please. Uh, no noise in excess of normal household noise. Uh, you won't be storing anything. Uh, no employees. Uh, Plant parking has been provided. Uh, you don't need to store a heavy vehicle or other heavy equipment. You don't have to be using any vehicles. Um, uh, any new lighting? Are you adding any lighting? Outside lighting. Outside oh, lighting. yeah. Um, there's actually a light uh, that's on the little path to the entrance that we added. Okay, so it will not exceed one foot candle at the boundary level. Uh, a flag lot. Uh, we don't have the review period anymore. Uh, all special permits for home businesses are non transferable and are issued to the applicant for a specific business. Subject to approval of other boards if and as required, including Conservation Commission, Board of Health. Um, any projects direct changes directed by other boards must be approved by the Planning Board. And that's it. That is the motion. Any motion and a second? Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 401 F6. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, um, we'll get into the library. Oh. They didn't sign up for anything. Anybody here well, for the library? on the agenda. Are they here for the library? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. They didn't sign up. Well, I, I put them on the agenda. All right. Okay. So. All right. Okay. My name is Phil O'Brien and Johnson Roberts, I'm the architect for the library. We've got a couple other folks here if there are any questions that come up. Some information I want to share with the board. Um, we forwarded this information ahead of time. Um, I'm going to start with the planting plan. Um, this is the planting plan for the library proper. Um, as you know, Middle Street is here. We're coming in on this side. This connects into the rest of the Senior Center Lodge and the exit drive comes out along it here. The main entrance to the library is off of the lot here. 
we've got a series of uh, parking lot trees to provide shade inside the lot. Uh, these match the trees that are happening in the rest of the senior center. What, what are any of those trees existing in the all new? There's, there are trees that exist out uh, in the in the, in, in the in the in the in the town right away. But that's there's right. Nothing. There's, there's there's nothing on the property. So those are all new trees. That's right. That's okay. these are new. Right. <coughs> so these are uh, honeysuckle that matches the, the, the trees that were proposed that are proposed for the for the senior center that happens, uh, and that is all the larger trees that happen around in the parking areas. We have a Coosa dogwood. Uh, there's some dogwoods that actually happen. Uh, out in front of the existing library on their front lawn, uh, and the senior center is also posing a specimen Coosa dogwood on their property. So again, we're trying to tie the two properties together. Um, we've got some smaller. This is the Coosa dogwood here on the front lawn. Um, we've got some smaller plantings, um, foundation plantings, and then some plantings to um, in around some of the utilities that we have in the back lawn. Um, and then we have a small garden that we're creating um, with some uh, small plants where you might want to go sit. Uh, people can certainly sit in the front lawn if they like. We try to create a little spot if somebody wanted to go up and kind of take a look at the, at the flowers and bushes outside. That's it for the, for the planting. Um, the other thing that you folks had asked about specifically, is we, and we have shown you a number of uh, earlier renditions of the of the plan these are the most up to date this is where we are right now we're into the just getting into the working drawing phase and so the design of the building is pretty much set at this point we wanted to show you these upgraded drawings these um, these renderings haven't changed very much from what we showed the board earlier um, but there were some minor modifications in the layout of some of the windows and so forth and we just wanted you to see that uh, we also took a closer look at some of the coloring on the building uh, and wanted to make sure that we were as close as we could be in terms of what we're planning for the coloring of the brick masonry. It's obviously a red brick masonry that we're using to kind of pick up on the color from the, uh, it's going to be compatible. We're trying to find something that's very similar to the, uh, the plan is to have a brick that's very similar to what happens at the existing library. Kind of a medium gray roof. We're looking at asphalt shingle roof for the entire roof system. And then we have some cast stone in the idea there is it's kind of a warm beige color, like a, like a natural limestone. All the trim and everything else? This is, this is all that kind of cast stone, limestone trim, the no, lintels no, over no, the window. white and everything else in there. This, that's, yeah. all, that's all cast stone. Oh, that's all stone? That's all stone. Well, oh. up high, it's very thin. Okay. So we don't have to support all no, that no, load up there. Okay. Yes, oh, yes. Yes. So it's a, it's a heavy masonry product down here and we're in the lintels and then much lighter so that we can support it off the steel structure. Very low maintenance, maintenance precise. Yes, that's the idea. Right, right. Basically the entire... I wish, I wish the senior center did that because the senior center is going to pay big bucks in 30, for 30 years to paint that place. Well, I hope that's the case. Ex excellent design. Thank Th you. Thank you very much. Um, How much? Wood is being used in the building. What percentage of the construction materials is wood? The reason I'm asking is I was reading in the Wall Street Journal a couple weeks ago the price of lumber feet has collapsed 50% from July when these things were first coming before us. Uh, the structure on this building is steel. Yeah. So we don't. I don't expect any savings in that. But there's a little bit of wood trim and then a lot of the furnishings and so forth. The wood. Uh, we're hoping that will help with the cost of that material. Um, but we did look at the we, we did look at um, wood framing for the building. Uh, we just can't take the wind loads on a building like this and bring them down into the ground with wood without spending a lot of money. Right. All right. Yes. Just wanted to give you an update. I know that you would ask to uh, to take a closer look, for example, at some of these materials. Uh, and I'm wondering whether or not you would like us to come back with the actual materials once they've been approved during the construction phase. Is that something you'd like to see? The idea is to try to do a a, a medium gray asphalt shingle roof, but I don't know what the brand name is of the product that's going to get submitted to us for approval, for example. And I'm wondering if, if you'd like to see that. No, I mean, we really want, we want to see a picture of what you're showing there is what, show us what you're going to build ultimately when you finally get everything nailed down. That's the plan. That's the plan. Yep. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, brick is brick. I mean, red brick is red brick, to be honest with you. And you try to match existing library, existing buildings in town. In terms of the coloring. We're, we're, we're not going to be super fussy and say that red brick is this versus this red brick is better. Okay. We're, we're, we're not that. 
much. Okay. Just um, want to make sure that you get the information. The asphalt in. shingle, you're putting a gray asphalt shingle. It'll be a light gray, large, dark gray. Kind of a medium Again, gray. Again, I mean, a medium gray. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we're not going to sit here and nitpick to that point. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, it's going to be white, white, white stump. Okay. I mean, there's a gazillion different shades of white. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you bring something in, from my experience with white stone, you could be putting something under the cell that's slightly different than a white yeah, because that's just that's the nature of the beast. Across the building as well, yeah. you know, and it, it, we're not going to nitpick to that extent. You know, okay. brick building, white trim, white stone, white gray or medium gray asphalt. To be honest, from my point of view, that's good enough for me. Okay. That picture, you come up, you build something that looks very, very close to that. That's that's all I'm looking for. At least for Mike, you know, I'm not about the rest of what they feel any different. Okay. Lighting. The site lighting hasn't changed very much since the the last time we showed that to you. I think okay. I included a, a lighting plan in the package I gave you. Right. Um, we had a, a minor shift in one of our site lights um, in this area. Uh, we had a, a a site light on that island there, and in order to provide access to the parking at the back of that church. Uh, with one thought that one is, uh, we had to slide that light fixture over slightly, and so that we did some of the calculations slightly. But it's basically, it's essentially the same. As okay. Is the main Goodwood Memorial Library going with the new building? Uh, I understand it is no. The Goodwood Memorial, I understand, is is the is uh, upstairs in the existing building. There's plaques up there now, and that memorial is going to stay in that building, and so. Um, I'm not aware of anything other than public library at this point, but we don't at this point have any. We don't have any plans to put a sign on the building itself. We are looking at uh, signage up in the front lawn. We're working with the senior center right now to figure out what the best solution is to that. The, the library has an existing sign that sits out there now. They're, they're thinking they might want to move it. There's an existing sign out there now for the senior center. Um, what if this is something? What, what is it going to be called? Simply the Hadley Library. The working name of the library is the Hadley Public Library right now, but that's our working name. If there's a big, big donor, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but that's the, that's what we've been working with. That's what it says on all of our plans, the Hadley Public Library. Um, okay. And if, if that name changes, we're happy to. Yeah, the sign location. The signage, um, we're still working with the senior center right now. This is, there's an existing senior center sign that sits out here now. The library has a sign that they would like to move. Um, there's talk that we might be able to consolidate that into a single sign, um, given the amount of space that's there in the trees. Um, but we haven't we haven't worked that out yet with this. Be aware sign. of the setback. That's a yeah, we're going to comply with the sign by about 64 square feet. Yeah. So we'll, once once we get that settled with the senior center, we'll come back and make a the front yard is like that. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this there's a sign out there now for the senior center, and there's a sign out here now for. Uh, there's actually two signs. So there's, there's one on Route 9, and then there's, there's a larger one here on, on Middle. Are you soliciting donations for this? I personally am not, but I'm sure <laughs> that the folks at the library would love What do you consider a big donor? Um, I, I don't, um, I'm not aware. Maybe you want to talk about that, Alison? Well, whether or not there is a limit uh, to what you can donate, my guess is that you could donate as much as you want. Um, but I don't know that anybody has made the determination that they've shared with me that they will name the building after you if you give a certain amount of money. I'm not aware of that. Well, we could talk, Mike. <laughs> we do. There is a pledge form online, and it does list some naming opportunities. Um, there's no building naming opportunity, but individual rooms have individual I, price I first would like to see the library simply called the Hadley Public Library and not named after anybody. Well, that is so currently our point, working right, name. That's two cents. So this, but there's, there is no naming opportunity at this point. Uh, there, there is no identified naming opportunity for the building now. I don't know the answer to that. Goodwin get his name on the old He was one of the original trustees. In fact, he was the one who took the money because Edward Hopkins died. Ah. So he was the original, one of the original trustees. And the trustees still live on, not quite as old as the school. Okay. The last board I had was a floor plan, if you were interested in seeing that. Yeah, that, that, that hasn't seen it. That hasn't seen it. Uh, you know, what was, uh, 
the date? What was the date of the prior meeting when we approved it? The second meeting in December? December. <coughs> Third Tuesday of November. November twentieth, of course. Yeah, November twentieth. Okay. November twentieth. Okay, I'll make a motion to amend the uh, site, uh, the original site plan uh, as approved November 20 as follows. Um, the board determines the proposed changes are not significant or major and can be addressed without reopening the public hearing. And what we have reviewed is, and do you have, what? just to, to read off the dates on the, that plan set, that's what you said, what you emailed to us, correct? Yes. This is dated the 2nd of October, 2018. The elevation plan is dated 11 January, 2019. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll go with the, the plans as, uh, and what I'll do is I'll print out what you sent us and attach it so that there's no confusion. Okay. Um, but we're working off the revised plans of October 2, 2018 and of uh, January 11, 2019. I might have a set of those if you want them. Hmm? I might have a single set of those if you want them, 11 by 17? Uh, okay. No, I'll, I will print okay. them out at 8 and a half by 11. Okay. Uh, you, you sent me the PDF of that. Yes, I did. Yeah, so I have all of that. I'll just produce that at a smaller scale just so there's no confusion sure. about what we are approving. Okay, that's the motion to approve the plans as revised. Okay. Any other discussion? We have motion, we have a second. Second. We have motion, second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 401 absent. Thank you very much. There you go, Marilyn Mish. Okay, uh, I'm sure what most people are here for is the continuing discussion of the marijuana zoning bylaws proposed. And after our last meeting, I published, I, you know, updated the uh, draft, mailed it out to everybody that was on the mailing list. We got a number of comments back, and I have been trying to get in touch with somebody that's knowledgeable of the marijuana system, for lack of a better term. And I had two contacts. One of them was only here for a couple of days and I was not able to get in touch with them. But I was able to contact today a grower of cannabis that, that has been a grower for six plus years in Canada. And he is a grower, he is a consultant, and he's extremely knowledgeable, um, so he says, of cannabis. And I asked him a whole bunch of questions because the stuff on the internet, there's fact, fiction, and how much of it is real and what's junk. And given that he's a grower, that may or may not preju prejudice a bunch of you with his comments. And I was extremely surprised at his replies to a bunch of this stuff. And I asked him, number one, does the stuff stink? Does it smell? And if it does, how much? You know, as far as is it a mild smell? Is it overpowering? Is it tolerable? And he says, there is strains of marijuana that smell. There's strains of marijuana that virtually have no odor. And everything in between. He says, and the odor has absolutely no relation to, TL, to TLC. He says, some of it smells like fruit, and some of it smells like skunk. He says, um, he compared it to craft brewing, not like a commercial brewery, but if you've ever been to a craft brewery, he says, some of the odors and smells in a craft brewery will turn your stomach. He says, others find that 
aroma in a craft brewery very appealing, depending on your level of what you like. He says, cannabis is very similar to that. He says, but it does have a strong odor. What's surprising to me, I asked him, does this smell all the time or just when it's blossoming? He says, cannabis smells all the time. When it's not blossoming, it has a very strong odor. But if it's just sitting there after and before the flowering, it does have an odor. He says it's not overpowering, but you definitely smell it. How close do you have to be to it to smell it? From what he says, depending how much is growing. I'll get into that. Okay, okay let me, let me, let me I, I will get into that. He, he had some interesting comments on uh, zoning proposals. And okay, basically he says, you know, cannabis smells. He says that the odors can be controlled. I asked him, and this is, again, this is, he lives in Ontario, Canada, so you're going to consider the climate when you have some of these answers. I says, you know, do you open grow? Do you grow in buildings? Do you grow in greenhouses? What do you do? He says, there's open grow in Canada, but he says, given the climate, there's not much because the growing season is much smaller or shorter than you'll have down there in the lower states. I said, okay, that's understood. He says, there is some grown, but he says, not much. Almost everything that's grown in Canada is grown in enclosed buildings. Um, he says it's relatively easy, although expensive, to control odors in a building that's up to about 50,000 square feet. If the building is up to 100,000 square feet, he says, we have very poor results controlling the odors on a building that large because of the volume of air that needs to be filtered, brought in, and brought out. He says when you have an enclosed building, he says the air quality is everything to the quality of the product. You need to filter the air in and filter the air out. He says if you don't filter the air in but just bring air in, he says you will probably be contaminating your cannabis in some way or form. He says, there, he says there, there's, there's pretty tight controls in Canada on the quality of the product. It's like there is proposed to be tight control on the quality and what's in the cannabis in, in Massachusetts. And that's interesting. He said, you know, it's expensive. He says a filtering system for approximately a 20,000 square foot building, just the cost of the filtering system with the HVAC, he says, of $50,000. He says, that's the equipment plus the installation and the operation. And he says, you start talking bigger buildings, obviously it's more. He says, for a 50,000 square foot building, the initial investment is probably somewhere in Canada between three to five million dollars minimum and up beyond that. He's depending on what you want to cover. He says, so it's, it's pricey to get into it. Um, he says, I recommend that you limit your zoning bylaw to nothing larger than 50,000 square feet um, initially, and you only allow enclosed buildings. He says, do not allow open grow, and this again, this is what he's telling me, do not allow greenhouses. He says, because marijuana to be controlled and good quality needs 12 hours of light every day and 12 hours of darkness. 365 days a year. The amount of light and the amount of darkness will greatly affect the quality of the marijuana. He says too much of one, too much of the other, and you're going to have inconsistent quality. He says in quality of marijuana, quality of cannabis is everything. He says uh, it's extremely profitable. He says you're talking some serious money on the people growing the stuff. He says if they can grow it properly. He says so you the bylaw you're proposing, he says, needs to have some kind of a uh, size allowed to it where there's like an, a bit of an economy of scale. He says, if it's too small, nobody's going to be able to afford to do it. And if it's too large, he says, you're going to lose control. He says, start out with the enclosed buildings. Then after a couple of years, after you get some experience under yourself, and then you can say, well, you know, maybe now we want to allow this or we want to allow that. And he says pretty much where they're growing it, 
um, is in industrial areas. He says we do have some growing relatively close to residential areas. He said, but again, we're talking high filtered, high filtered stuff. Um, he says in a 50,000, his, his, he kept mentioning 50,000 square foot building as a maximum. He says we've had excellent results controlling odors on a 50,000 square foot building. He says, I'll be honest with you, he says you never filter out all of the odors. He says always some escaping. But he says up to the 50,000 square foot building, for whatever reason, we've had great results filtering and keeping the odors so that it doesn't bother anybody. He says we have a couple of hundred thousand square foot facilities around, and he says, and they're a disaster. I asked about security. He says, you know, fencing, door alarms, card readers, stuff to get in and out. He says, but to be honest with you, he says, I have never heard of a security breach at any marijuana facility in Canada, or at least in Ontario, where, we're, where we are. He says, for some reason, he says, you know, people just aren't breaking into them. He says, they're not breaking into the, to, to the stuff to steal anything. He says, where some of the facilities are located, they're located near some very uh, high-priced residential areas. He says, they're going to break into something. It's not going to break into a marijuana facility to steal, steal some plants. They're going to break into the homes. He says, and to be honest, he's, I'm, I'm not... You know, being a wise guy here, he says, we really have not had any issues with breaking and entering into the marijuana facilities. So, you know, he got, I've got his name and phone number. He said, call me if you've got other questions. He's after your meeting, see if you've got some more questions. He says, you know, that you want me to try to give you answers to? He says, I'm glad to help you. Like I said, he's a grower, been a grower for um, in excess of six years. He's also a consultant to other facilities. I didn't ask him how much he grows. But it sounds like he's probably in the, you know, under the 50,000 square foot. He's not a, he's not a big company growing stuff. He's kind of a single guy. He'd be, he's part of a big, bigger consulting company to the cannabis industry. But as himself, he's not any kind of a monster grower. Is, is cannabis growing regulated at the uh, province level there or at the local level? Both. Uh -huh. it, it, the, this, the province allowed medical marijuana about, I think he said six or seven years ago. And he says a bunch of, some people jumped into it, and I think he said, I'm not sure if it was three or four years ago, it became much like here, the adult use. And he says and it's, there's a lot of places and people into it. Um, and well, What about the number of growers allowed in the province? Is that at the province level or the, or the local municipality level? It is, the number of growers is regulated by municipality, uh, hmm. They don't have, I don't want to call it municipality, but it's, it's, he, he called it, it sounds like it's, by, it's almost like a county, I think, that they have up yeah, there, right. as opposed to an in individual town. I mean, their governing is, is different than, than, than in the states here. So I don't know, I mean, I didn't, I didn't get into that detail, but there's basically local controls, and overall, um, the province of Ontario has controls. And I didn't get into, you know, how much of each is. I was more concerned with odors, right. uh, how to control it, does it stink, and security and stuff. I wasn't into really, you know, who controls it, um, you know. Because when he was answering some of my questions, he seemed to be answering more about a Canada level as far as the governing. And that's understandable. He doesn't really that understand it probably that much about Massachusetts, okay. So, just as a, as a you know... I've got one more contact I want to talk to. This is a commercial grower in California. And we've probably all seen the stuff about the, the horror stories in California and everything else that comes from the New York Times and everything else. Well, you know, again, that's a place that probably has more open growth. Um, Oregon, too. Well, yeah, but the New York Times has a thing. And like I said, the open grow in Canada is very little, not so much, I don't think, as far as the limiting factor of the controls as much as the climate. You know, they, their, their climate, you're talking probably 500 miles north of here. So there's, you know, quite a difference in a growing season. So that self-regulates the outdoor grow there. He did say that cannabis is extremely sensitive to 
sucking up like a sponge. We talked about that, he says, and that's why the filtering of the air in is extremely critical because if you don't have good air coming in, he says, you're not going to get the good quality coming out. So, you know, anybody got any questions that I just kind of talked about that I would be, you know, more than willing to talk to the gentleman about? Yes? Okay, so in Canada, um, are they allowed to do business with banks or is it like for, for now in, in the U.S. it's then that it has to be a cash business because banks are discouraged from doing business with these kinds It's of legal problems. in all Canada now. It's legal. Um, say, say that again now. It's what? In Canada, is it legal for these growers to do do their cash flow businesses with banks? Oh, I didn't get into that. Well, because the problem with the security and the, uh, the crime has been that um, that they've had to be cash businesses, and so that's the risk. That's a big risk with security in the U.S. Yeah, but I sincerely doubt that they have cash, but in the grow facility. Well. I don't know. That's but it, in Canada, it's it's a uh, nationwide right. approval. Right. So I'm guessing that the U.S. They are is able to not yet, and the so yeah. Yeah. And the problem, it was on 60 Minutes in Colorado. If you are in in the business, you have a, a safe that's this big, because you couldn't put it in the bank. But the FTIC did make exemptions for Colorado. Obviously, to track the money, so for tax purposes. Yeah, I, I, I didn't even ask him about that. Yeah, that's that's the aspect that's of it. Okay. Anything else for now? Yes, sir. Uh, did you say whether or not he was marketing his products for uh, direct, like, smokable intake, or was it something that was being refined further into, uh, like, oils or resins or something? All of that. They, they, he, he did mention that. When it was medical marijuana, it was really, uh, you know, there wasn't a big market for it, obviously. But now under the commercial growing, they use it to smoke pot, regular the old smoke pot. They make it into cookies. They make it into gummy bears. They make it into all kinds of things. It's, 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 it's the, from what he said, it's very much like here. The farmer, for lack of a term, but the grower grows it and sells it to a... Uh, processing facility. They don't typically process it on site. And they, the processing facility turns it into a variety of topics. You know, oils, um, you know, everything in Tink between. Tinkers, Cookies, gummy tinkers. bears, smoking, regular stuff like that. So it, it sees quite a uh, variety of end uses. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just curious, more or less to, uh, I guess, discern you know, the high quality standards that he's maintaining uh, are often used for smokeable and direct ingestion products, you know, with the mycotoxins, the fungus, things like that. Uh, but when you further refine it um, into the oils at those processing facilities you mentioned, um, a lot of those things can be stripped away through distillation and through purification of hydrocarbons, things okay. of that nature. Yeah. Um, so I guess with that being said, it would, it would open up for, I guess, not looser, but someone could grow, uh, I guess, a less less sealed, less, um, I guess not a warehouse type structure, you can get away with growing in a greenhouse or, or even somebody, um, I guess, who would, who would pursue open cultivation could take a slightly contaminated product, run it through a, a processing facility of pharmacological quality, don't get me wrong, and it could come out with a product that is clean, that would pass all the mass produced preservation, um, just to make, and the board aware of that. I mean, the guy sounds like a, a very good expert, and I agree with many of his points, but I would make the board aware of that, that it is not the only option to grow in a warehouse because you have to maintain a certain pinnacle quality. Um, there are there is room for uh, you know marketing products outside of that that are variable quality, maybe not your A plus grade stuff. But yeah, and, 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 and that's true, but and, and, but the less from my experience working some place that did I mean was it marijuana, but we processed stuff. The less processing you have to do, then the rate of the profit and you try to process as little as possible because it's simply less expensive and your profit margin is obviously more. Yeah, yeah. So you don't want to be processing six steps if you can do one or two steps. Right. Well, I guess a business entrepreneur uh, standpoint, someone who's going to invest in a, a warehouse type facility, 
they certainly don't want to be spending extra time on processing. But if you're you know, a vegetable farmer who's making incredibly low margins already on things like squash, corn, um, to get the type of margins that you get off that oil, off those, uh, something that have to be processed a few extra times, it's still well, vastly, if, vastly higher than that. Uh, and and, and some of that is, de is dependent on finding somebody that will process it for you. You know, like, well, again, places where I worked, well, we're getting into we're getting way off track, so we'll leave that. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, Jim, okay. you were mentioning the uh, the upper limit would be fifty thousand square feet, and you didn't mention the lower limit. He said there's a threshold. I, I didn't ask about a lower limit. Okay, I would, I, would, I, you know, I wasn't really mentioning much. I want to get information out of him, and when he said you know fifty thousand, that's you know that's that's bigger than what obviously we want to do right now. Yeah. Um, you know, we're looking at the you know the the small grower. And uh, he did say that a 20,000 square foot building, that you would probably have about 15,000 square feet of actual canopy. And the canopy typically grows 10 feet tall. Um, he says with a, you know, with, a, with a canopy of that size, he says you will get you know, a lot of product resulting out of it. I didn't get into details of what the yields are or anything like that because I'm not really interested in the yield. I'm interested more in the the mechanics of the problems and the products as opposed to, you know, profits and everything else. Yes, sir. Did you get a sense from him on how many of these 50,000 square foot or larger facilities there are in any particular area? No, so just a quick back of the envelope calculation. It's exactly the size of a football field. 50,000 okay. square foot, it's 300 feet, 560 feet. So I'm just wondering, he had a feeling from the how many. No, I didn't ask him. Yeah. No. Do you know where 80% of the Canadian population lives within 50 miles of the U.S. border? So. It's completely different. It's up there. I mean, you can grow the stuff 100 miles up, and there's nobody yeah. for miles and miles and miles. Right. Yeah. Well, in the same thing, I went to the hearing where Deerfield approved 120,000 square feet of greenhouses. For growing marijuana, so, uh, so okay. we'll be able to see if there's the reaction, the smell. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I read in okay. the paper the other day that there are 1.3 million pounds of marijuana in, that has been processed in Oregon that they don't know what to do with. There's oversupply there, yeah. so thinking that this is going to be a money maker, the laws of supply and demand work here just like anything else: tobacco, potatoes, pigs. Okay, okay. Any other questions on, on, on that particular topic? Okay. Um, getting on to some of the comments here. Um, what are things that, before we get into the mailed in comments, some of the stuff, a few things that were added to the bylaw, because originally we only allow, we're going to allow enclosed facilities. And after talking with Bill after the meeting, we decided, Bill and I decided, um, only as two people granted, and it still can be amended, that um, I was reading up on, somebody was mentioning about blackout greenhouses. So I looked up and read, what is a blackout greenhouse? And again, going back to what the gentleman said about 12 hours of light, 12 hours of darkness, a blackout greenhouse is a greenhouse that has a removable black canopy. And during the day, to, during the summer days, you close it to keep it to 12 hours of darkness, or 12 hours, 12 and 12, and during the winter, you keep it open to get the, the sunlight in, and then you close it at night when you put the lights on so that the light does not escape into the atmosphere. And supposedly, from what I was reading, again, on the internet, of companies that actually sell these products, they work very well and they're very efficient in both terms of preventing light from coming in and light from escaping outwards. Um, you know, they're not, obviously you can still see some light, but it's not like it illuminates the sky. You can probably, you know, it's like probably looking at a, a house light or something like that off in the distance. That you can see some light there, but it's not going to be uh, a problem to the neighbors and to the neighboring areas. And I you know, Bill and I says, well, if that works and it prevents the lights, then, you know, I'll, I'm, a hoop house, so-called, because these are really made for hoop houses and regular greenhouses, 
then what's the problem if they if it meets the bylaw in that term then making it an enclosed building because it'd be a lot less expensive to put a, a blackout greenhouse up than building some kind of a you know enclosed house for lack of a better term at least it might be a whole lot more economical so in our bylaw you would still say an enclosed building or do you have different I have wording? the words are an enclosed building or blackout style type greenhouse and we still have the words in there that no light and odors can escape. I think that's the, the important thing. Is the result we want is that, correct, Jim said, no, no yeah. light, no odors escape. Yeah, I got you. How you accomplish that, <clears throat> well, the zoning's not supposed to address construction issues anyway, right. materials. But, but what if a, a little light? Escapes well, a, li a little or light a little, or a little odor escapes. And, uh, well, for, first of all, a little light will escape. We're, I mean, we're not sure. we're not going to try, try to say this the place the one to be totally dark. I wanted to ask that question. Right. Thank okay. You. As far as an odor escaping, we're still trying. We're still saying that no odor shall be discernible at the boundary. Okay. Um, from what this gentleman told me today, I didn't get into that much detail. He says odors will escape the building. He says that is inevitable. Will the odors be a problem? He says we have not had, we have some uh, facilities that are relatively close to residential areas. I didn't say how close. Is he going a quarter mile, half a mile, a hundred feet? He re didn't really ask that. I didn't get into that kind of detail. He says but we're we have odor controls on the building. We have not had complaints of the area residents. So, you know, I, I need to again. I talked with the, I talked there for 20 minutes today, just getting an overall broad based picture. Um, I had more questions I want to ask him, but I also didn't want to spend two hours on the phone with him for that reason. So I'm, I intend to call him back again. And find out. Okay, now that we, you know, from what we talked about tonight, some other comments to come up. I have a chance to think about what he told me. What about these things? Like, you know, how close are you to this? What about this? And a few other, you know, more details to try to get some more, you know. And hopefully, this other gentleman from California, he would, I think, be a really good contact if I can get in touch with him because of the horror stories you read about in the newspaper, the New York Times, on California. Okay, you know, again, how much of this is true? What's the real story? Um, by speaking to a grower, my opinion was take it with a grain of salt, but if the guy, if the person starts telling you what seems to be very good information, then you're probably getting, you know, he says, oh, there's no order. Well, obviously, I wouldn't believe that. But from what he told me, I think he is credible on the stuff that he told me. Okay, I mean, it doesn't seem like he's trying to buffalo me. He gave me some good input on, on what we, he would recommend that we do. Um, so, go from there. So, Jim, the only open grow then. Yeah. Excuse me. Yes. I just want to make a comment about the blackout curtains. I think they're actually used to keep the sunlight out of the plants to force them into flowering, as opposed to keeping the light in the greenhouse at night. The lights would be off. It's usually a 12 hour daylight to 12 hour night. And they're looking when the longer days are there that they're actually looking to limit the light in the greenhouse to put the plants in complete darkness. So the premise of light being on all night long is not usually something that's used in the growing of it. It's a lot like a poinsettia crop. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Christmas. Yeah. I mean, if, if it prevents the sunlight from coming in total darkness, then I don't believe the reverse would be true as long as the light coming exactly. out. Exactly. Well, he did make he did mention something to me that we need to be cognizant of that they do in Cal that they do in Canada. They have <clears throat> growers that grow marijuana. I'm going to use Mr. Giles here because he's the perfect example of this. Not that I'm going to, he's going to do this, but he he grows the marijuana, but he doesn't grow it from seed. I'm going to be a grower that only grows marijuana from a seed into a plant so high. 
I now sell it to somebody else. They take, just like you, you buy your flowers and, and vegetables, everything else in the spring, you're a greenhouse grower. You only grow them to a certain point, and now you sell them to somebody else. Something that he mentioned, he said, that has become a very big business in Canada where this person grows the seedlings and then they sell them to the home guy they that has a dozen the plants. They sell them to the commercial grower so that the grower doesn't have to waste their time. They take that so-called you know, six inch plant and right away put them into the greenhouse and they're, they got a kick start on growth. They don't, they're not, they're ahead of the, of the curve if you would on growing. And he said that has become very, uh, a lot of it is, is going on in Canada. And he says, and to be honest with you, he said that was something that fell through the, through the regulation loophole. So that, I says, I says that's, that's interesting where, you know, um, you know, you're, you're buying a, a, a box of, uh, you know, six six plants for whatever the, whatever the price might be. Well, it's just like the, you're buying tomato plants or uh, yes, zucchini, yes, whatever. Yeah, yes, sir. Do you think the state's seed to sale program would prevent that type of leakage? A what? The seed to sale program that this, the state has enacted in terms of tracking the cannabis from seed to flower to retail. Um, do you think that would prevent leakage to from to homeowners to entities that you don't want to buy? Again, I, I, I don't know. Well, homeowners, homeowners can have how many plants in the backyard? 12? Well, and if you've got two people, you can have 24. No, 12, six, 12 total? Six for farms and 12 per household. Um, that, that's a I, I, good question. I have no idea. Because when he mentioned that to me, I was like, well, that's an interesting phenomenon. And, well, you know, it's possible. I, I, I don't know. I could. You know, I, I don't have a, it was just something to think about. And, uh, you know, um, you know, again, I know that how the, 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 the uh, idea of the uh, um, ID tag or the electronic tag for cradle to grave, would that address it? I don't know. You think it would, if it has a desired destination, a certain destination yeah, where it's supposed people, to end up? The homeowner doesn't need the cradle to grave tag, so. <clears throat> that, again, but the business does, is what I'm saying. The business so does. The business would then be approaching. That, that would be an interesting one. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I've got to think that level of regulation would have to take place on the state level. It couldn't be. Uh, yeah, that's not something we could regulate. But I'm just. But that's something that isn't in the bylaw anywhere. They're assuming that everybody's going to grow their own from seed and harvest it, and then obviously send it, sell it to a processor. But there's an in-between step that's very possible. And it could be very lucrative for some companies, for some people. Because, I mean, you wouldn't need a monster greenhouse and a very expensive one to grow, you know, a, a, a plant so big because the order is virtually non-existent. I mean, it's slight, but it's certainly not like it when it comes to the flower point. Anyways. But it, it's a good point, Jim, because many farmers in Hadley get their plants, whether it be pepper plants or tobacco plants, from Canada. Evidently Canada has a, a sweetheart deal with the farmers. If you have some natural gas on your property, uh, the farmer can get the greenhouse up and going for very little cost because they get the the gas natural gas free. So that's that's why. It, it certainly is a lot more profitable than growing Heirloom tomatoes on uh, Route 47. <laughs> we, we did get a bunch of comments, I mean, several comments, let me say a bunch, we got several comments um, emailed to us. One of them from a gentleman, um, basically, typo changes, and I would say that for the typo change, we'll probably incorporate virtually all of them because it's simply correcting grammar errors. We've got another one that uh, it says allow for tier three in ag residential districts. That that was a confusing one because they seem to be referring. I don't know if it was a prior draft, but the numbering is different. Yeah, it it 
refers to section 29 and we're in section 30 and yeah, exactly. his numbers don't line up with our numbers. This was uh, Michael Lopato? Me, Lopario. Oh, okay. Lopato. Yeah. Lopato, okay. I can't read my own name. Yeah, and so maybe I pull up the prior set of bylaws that I had. Uh, it, it might be, but uh, this was the three. Yeah, um, yeah essentially yeah. Was, I touched on some of the points that you already spoke about today about allowing for to expand the definition of enclosed buildings to something like these blackout greenhouses or high tunnels of some sort. Um, and then the second point was just to uh, allow for a larger tier package in the, the ag, ag res, um, moving that to something like a tier three rather than a tier one. Um, we talked last meeting about um, a lot of the security up front and just the, you know, whether it be the legality up front, the things that the farmer, the grower um, has to do is it's fairly financially taxing. And so allowing for a tier three would give a little bit more room to, uh, to make the necessary margins. Especially, you know, given the, the saturation of the market, we're ex you know, expecting in a few years having that those two extra whatever it is, you think the twenty five thousand square foot the tier three is. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, tier three is ten thousand. Ten to twenty thousand square feet. Right. So expanding, I think that would allow not only for the farmer, the grower to make up for some of those initial fees, that being legal security, just to get the operation up and running, but also give room for. Uh, when the, the market itself becomes saturated with products, um, you know, you can still produce a little bit more um, in that type of facility. And I think it also offers like a, a happy middle ground between some of the concerns, more concerned folk and people that sort of just wanted to hit the ground running. It's not a, it's not a massive package like a tier 11 that we're seeing in the industrial zones. Um, and it's also not an open, open field cultivation. It is being in these enclosed structures that can be fitted with um, whatever odor control mechanisms that you know, the board and the state sees fit. After what the gentleman told me today, um, tiers 2 through 11 in the business district, I don't think we want to go to tier 211 in the business district. We probably want to keep that in the industrial district and maybe go tiers two through six in a business district. But he says 50,000 square feet seems to be a very, seems to be the size of a building that you can control odors in much better than the 100,000 square foot. And the, the closer you get to 100,000 square feet and larger, he says, the more you lose control. He says the, the ventilation systems don't seem to work in a larger building, for whatever reason, maybe because it's so massive. He said in a, he used the number of 20,000 square foot building, needs to have approximately 100,000 CFM ventilation. That's 100,000 square feet, 100,000 cubic feet of air movement a minute. That is a massive amount of air. If you, I don't want to say a, a 100,000 square feet building is uh, five times that large because that doesn't work. But it would be incrementally larger because of the cubic feet. But plants don't care about air, they care, care about carbon dioxide. No, no, to control the odors. Oh, okay. And he says the filtering system, they're using carbon filters. Carbon filters are expensive, make no doubt about it and you need to filter the air coming in. Again, this is what he's telling me, so I'm not you know, taking this as absolute gospel, but when you think about it, it makes sense. If you're bringing out 100,000 square feet a minute, you gotta be bringing in good air at, a, at at least the same rate, otherwise you're gonna have some very weird uh, air currents within the building. And he says to filter the, again, it all gets down to quality. He says, you know, quality in, Good quality air coming in, air going out gives you good quality product, which obviously makes sense. He said, if you're in an area where you may not have the best of air, he says you want to make sure you're filtering your, you're filtering your air coming in. And so he kept mentioning that anything above 50,000 square feet is a very difficult uh, size building to 
control the air quality. Okay, so that raises another question. I'm not sure that we, that we address noise, because if you have equipment to move 100,000 yeah. cubic feet per minute, well, good that's point. going to be... Good like, point. Um, those fans will be humming. Yeah, that, I, you're right. I didn't even think of that one. You're right. Just as an aside, what portion of Hampshire College is in Hasley? You know, just talk about Hampshire College. Uh, Their solar field. The solar so, field, so, the, police, the, the, the uh, police grounds are in Hadley. buildings? Um, None of the campus structures. It's all in Amherst. Huh? Most of the yeah. support is in Hadley, like this, the solar. Right. I think part of the buildings and grounds. Buildings and grounds. Maybe a very small portion of the, uh, oh, the grounds for the, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, what is that? The Eric? What is the museum? The Eric, Eric, Eric Carl. Museum, Eric that's Carl that's Museum. Some of the grounds are in Hadley. A lot of the walking paths around that are in Hadley. They use no, no, none of, very well. few of the actual campus yeah. to board Bill's point. But it's just like you know some of the support stuff in the, uh, you know, yeah. The reason I'm asking is they're, they're having severe financial problems over there. You probably read and the possibility exists that they're not going to make it. And, uh, Hampshire College? Yeah. 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 There's a lot of real estate over there. We're talking about not admitting a freshman class or first exactly. year class this exactly. uh, fall. That's wow. Okay. I will put something in there about noise from HVAC. Or, or noise period, not HVAC. Um, so what, what are we resolving is, as far as the districts? Uh, tier 1 through... Okay. So in the business district... In business district, I'm going to recommend that we go Tiers two through six. Yeah, tiers two through six. Okay. Industrials, industrial, yeah. Two through eleven. Because I don't think we can say you can't put them in at all because the town is voted to allow it. So we'll just change that part of the uh, in the districts, and everything else will stay the same. So how much in the industrial? Two to eleven. So One hundred thousand square feet. Yep. <clears throat> um, there was a number of people have voice voice concern time and time again about setting back 300 feet from the property line of the residential dwelling and you know they want to see 500 they want to see a thousand a thousand I think if we put well if we put a thousand in you're going to virtually eliminate <clears throat> anything in most business districts and extremely limited in the industrial districts. And Attorney General will probably throw out the bylaw when they see that because it's too restrictive. 500 feet will virtually eliminate much of the business districts because except for um, Route 9 from about the bike path to the Amherstown line, the business district is only 500 feet deep to 300 feet deep from Route 9. So we're going to eliminate all those areas, and when you look at it in detail, they're going to probably say, that's too restrictive. Yes, sir? Could you limit that restriction to just the res ag areas and not, and not have it apply to the industrial or business districts? Then your point is? I'm saying, well, I, I understand. The point that Jim's making is, is if you... Let's say, let's arbitrarily say a thousand square foot would make most of the industrial and business areas inaccessible, right? Yes. Um, so why don't you exclude those from that and just keep that, whatever the foot thing is, 500,000 to res ag, but not have that same restriction in the business? And, and my, 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 my comment is going to go back to that one is, what is a thousand feet going to get us that 300 feet isn't going to get us. Well, if you add the, I think part of the concern is if you add in, you know, how wide, I don't know the right proper term, but how wide a road is and how far a setback from a road is, when you subtract that from the 300, 
if you're across the street from a potential facility, it gets very close, right? It's no longer really 300 feet from the, the, the right of way of a road and it's without Hadley is a maximum of 50 feet. Okay. Okay. So the closest the facility could be, in worst case scenario, if you're on, if the house is on this side of the road and there's a street and then a marijuana grow facility would be 250 feet from the uh, Your property, right. property line. Yeah. And Shattuck Road is narrower. Um, but you go from the right of way, right? I mean, it's not the edge of the road. It's the, 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 50, the, right, the right of way is 50 feet wide, maximum, I mean, with the exception of the industrial. Well, I got to put it into the uh, uh, venture way because that's a 60 foot right of way. I believe that's the only 60 foot right of way in town because that's the only industrial road in town. Everything else is 50 feet. Some, some places it's 35 feet. Well, a few of the very old roads. Well, staples. Is, yeah. mm. Okay. But, but that's part of what I was saying. We're not talking, we're talking about the right of way. The right of way of Shattuck Road is not 50 feet. It, if it's 30 feet, I'd be surprised in yeah, some it, spots. It, it, it varies. It's Shattuck is with County Highway. Yeah, county yeah. Layout. Some way, some place in Shattuck, it's probably what Bill said, some place it might be 50. But, you know, so the, so the closest, worst case scenario, the closest it could be is 250 feet. You know, right. we've got to get a, uh, a sense of when are we regulating and when are we prohibiting. And certainly the thousand feet, like you were indicating, Jim, is, is you're regulating to the extent that you are indeed prohibiting. Yeah. So can we get a feel from the uh, Attorney General in some way, Bill? We'd have to be, the Attorney General won't give us that. We'd have to get it from Town Council. Okay, well, from town council, because that's zoning in a nutshell is the delicate balance between the rights of the individual landowner and the rights of the individual, like yourself as a neighbor. So that's the delicate balance that we're dealing with here. And uh, you, we don't want to purposely make a mistake. And well, yeah, we, we've got to get this one very close to, we've got to, we've got to make this one right. So I think what we've been working through here is as we've gone to saying you're going to go away from open grow into inside grow with odor control. I think I'd like to think that takes a lot of the edge off of how close the grow facility is because a farmer can put up a tobacco shed pretty close to the property line. Um, if this is even set back further and it is unobtrusive, um, I think that controls most of the concern that was raised. Yeah. And, and of course, you mentioned the noise. It's all. Well, that, 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 that's, that's something that. Know the difference between mm -hmm. 250 and 450. Well, the, the noise we can address separately. The, the, the noise, when the noise, Bill, Bill made a good point. We start talking, it, and I didn't even think of that. Like anybody says, you've got some HVAC equipment. It can be extremely noisy. You go by the, uh, I like to use the old uh, grad research towers at UMass, because I went to school there. Those things are 20 stories up, but they hum, and you can hear them for, I want to say, a good half a mile. You go to some of the newer buildings on campus, particularly, I'll use the, uh, um, the new... Um, steam plant. As big as that is, and as much as that makes, there the noise coming out of that facility is very little. So you know they've been a, done a much better job of ad addressing the noise at that place than the old red research towers, and those things are however high in the air. So you know noise can be addressed, and we need to put something in here that noise at the boundary cannot exceed, you know, a number, okay, and, uh, you know. And unlike smell, that we, you can go out and buy or rent a, you, you, you can re a, a sound monitor and you can 
Uh, uh, part of the concern is with smell, it's arbitrary. I think it that's is why arbitrary. That's, and there that's is why California got into trouble because the people sued what they lost because how do you, you keep, if it's not measurable, how do you prove yeah. the damage? And that, that's kind of, a, I think, a concern in our neighborhood. Yeah. For smell, we have no real, once, once this yeah. is gone, once it's gone for there's no recourse. Yeah. But with sound, there is. Sound, so, you so, can so, say, sound, sound, is, sound is very decibels. easy to measure. And, you know, just, you know, if you, if we put a, a number in, like it can't be more than uh, probably something like 60 decibels at the, at the boundary line. Um, just as a quick thing, so under, everybody understands noise. There was a the, the, pet oh, hotel. The, can, the, the pet hotel across the Legion. Yeah. Was concerned about noise at that facility when before they built it, because they're going to be housing dogs 24/7. That's their, that's what they do. That's that's perfectly fine. And there's a lot of residences, obviously very close by, and the. Uh, a lot of the neighbors, we were talking about noise, they said, we wanted to see, you know, zero decibels. And I worked enough with sound to know that's impossible. And so I brought a decibel meter into this room and put it on a counter and nobody made a noise. The decibel reading in this room when it was dead quiet was 55. The noise of these fluorescent lamps made that much noise. Um, so we put a number on, I think it was like 65 or something like that, and just normal voice is probably in a 65 to 75 mm -hmm. range. And so once people understood what the numbers meant, they were much more comfortable with what the numbers that we put into the uh, common. So when you start hearing numbers of 55 and 60, if, if that's what we use, just so you'll understand, 55 or 60 is probably something like this, okay? And, you know, that's not going to be obtrusive to anybody. And yes. we know that they can do the job because we take our dog there. You cannot hear the animals from outside the front door. Yeah. Jim, I think to your point of, you know, talking about input from various people about the, the setback, I think what our goal is, and your goal as well, is to craft a bylaw that people can can support at town meeting. Yeah. We don't want it to fail. Um, it's, I think, in everybody's best interest that we pass it. And so, you know, what we don't want is to have people saying, well, I'm not voting for it because it's not restrictive enough or it's too restrictive. So, you know, in finding a number that that people can feel comfortable with and really feel that they can support, and, and so that it doesn't go the other way, you know, at town meeting. Well, just to, again, bear in mind, if it fails, right? No, there are no that's restrictions. my point. Yeah. Right. And, 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 to, and to that, that point, you know, just people will say, "Well, I want 500." Well, nobody has given us a real good reason on 500 why 500 is better than 300 or why 1,000 is better than 500, because of the controls that we put on for and noise and sound and odors and, and everything else. If those all, of those the, if those all work, the only thing is how close does that building appear closer than 500 versus 1,000 versus 300. And yeah, okay, it's a building. Well, like Bill said, you could put, a, put up a tobacco shed 50 feet away from the road and perfectly be legal and it would be much closer. This should be no more obtrus or obtrusive than that tobacco shed. It should be a lot smaller in many cases. And, or a greenhouse full that, of chickens. Right, that probably a thousand <laughs> feet would be, um, would not be something that a lot of people could support and feel is middle ground, but to, to um, Ken's point, um, it might be worth consideration to have a different number for um, ag res district than <coughs> in the other, if that's possible. I mean, because we understand business and industrial, the sites are limited, you know. Um, but it's, you know, in neighborhoods, that's the concern. I think so. Whether it can be differentiated that way, I don't know. That's, that's a good, I mean, We'll check with Joel Bard on that because okay. we're, 
I don't know why we should have any significant restrictions at all. In, I don't think we should have any significant restrictions at all in industrial. Was that 350 everywhere? Or? Why? I think I res. Yeah. You know? Well, there are houses in. No, 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 I, no, I was thinking one no. thing, and Bill just wrote down exactly what I was thinking to address what you said about the road. If you've got a 50 foot road, you could be theoretically 250 feet from the property line. Or from the, I mean, yes. Growing facility. Growing facility. So maybe we make the 300, 350, that way it ensures you're 300 feet from the road. And for the house that's on this side of the 50 foot right of way, and that, and of course, the road, the, road, the road is 30 feet wide, and you're a little further back. And that would ensure people walking, children waiting for the bus, whatever, would still be 300 feet. Yes. I, I would feel good about okay. that. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, the point we always get back to, if you can't smell the cannabis, if you can't see the cannabis, and if you can't hear any noises from um, the property line, what would be um, the real issue? Um, I feel like there's a lot of limiting factors for farmers already, and um, I don't see um, the point of having extra um, footage for the buffer zones. Um, it just doesn't really uh, make sense if you can't smell it, see it, or hear it. Again, we're getting back to the point that we're trying to find a middle ground where everybody is, like I said, when, I, when we started this a few months ago, the best we're going to do is 50% of the farmers will hate it and 50% of the residents are going to hate it. And if we do better than that, we're probably not going to. We're, going to, we're, going to, we're trying to get the 50-50 split and I'm, trying to, I'm not really being facetious here, I'm really relatively honest that, you know, I mean, Hopefully we do better than that, but that's hopefully where we can get at least to a ground where most people support this, and certainly if we go to town meeting, we need two thirds. Okay, and it, 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 this is this is the probably the most difficult bylaw we've had to work on since the three of us have been on this board, and that's quite a while. Okay. So yeah, we're, we're trying to listen to everybody and find some kind of a middle ground without, you know, hopefully we, this passes in the spring, or it passes in May, and maybe a year or two from now, we're back here amending this bylaw because we now have experience that says, you know, hey, this really isn't so bad. Maybe we allow this now. Maybe we allow this. Maybe we allow some open growth. Maybe we, we find something else out that, you know, the owners aren't that bad and we find out, you know, um, you know, it is what it is and we want to keep what it is. Yeah, you may find that you can plant, open, grow at your own risk. And if there is odor, you may be required to plow it under. But if you can plant odor, for low odor, you might be able to do it. Because the gentleman I talked to today says, there are there are some strains of marijuana that have a very low odor. You started mentioning brands, things to me, and you know, I, I don't care about the brands. I don't care about exactly what they're called. I mean, that's the fact that they exist is interesting. And what really surprised me, I always was under the impression: the greater the odor, the greater the TLC. He's that's not true at all. There's absolutely no correlation that he's aware of between odor and TLC. He says the vast majority of strains do smell. He did say some smell have a fruity smell. Some smells like strawberries. I said, well, you find those, but I doubt anybody's going to complain about strawberries. Mm -hmm. in, a so. in a previous meeting, did you mention that your family had some farmland and had a lot of farmland? Um, uh, yeah, there's a, a decent amount. Just we're trying to figure out who you, who you were. Just those what was your name? Oh, um, John Washkevitz, John Paul. Well, which Washkevitz clan? Okay. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead, explain. So we figured it out, John. <laughs> Going back to what Jim was saying, we also are happy to learn from any, anyone else. Uh, everyone's pretty much in the same boat, uh, except that every, the other communities are talking about their retail facilities. We have hardly said a word about retail facilities. Um, we've just all been on grow, uh, grow sites. Um, but the fact is that there is very little legally grown marijuana in Massachusetts. 
uh, right now. Nobody, it, we're, every community that is putting these bylaws together is doing it sort of in the blind uh, because we really don't know what some of the practical applications are going to be. Um, East Hampton has had a bylaw for probably all close to a year now, but they're just getting their first retail. I don't know if they have any growing going on over there. Um, Where's Whateley, you said? Or Deerfield. 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 Deerfield and Whateley, both Whateley's um, this week. So, so they have bylaws in place, but they don't have any experience in what that's going to, uh, what that's going to produce yet. Uh, as these places get experience, we'll all be talking. Um, yeah. Pioneer Valley Planning Commission meets as a body every three months, and all of the plan representatives of all the planning departments from all of the member communities get together for dinner and a topic of some sort. Uh, this is something we're going to be actively, you know, we're going to stay engaged with this going forward, but. We just have to uh, we just have to get something, put a stake in the ground. Now we have a reference point, and we go up or down from there. It and certainly personalities do make a difference. In Deerfield, the hearing that I went to, the gentleman uh, raises a lot of flowers. He happens to be Dutch, and he's highly respected in the community. And his presentation was a little different than the presentation that you all had in the uh, public safety building, where people were not happy with the individual presenting it because there was a history involved with the greenhouse. So personalities do make a difference, too. The, uh, maybe I would, love to take a, I would love to take a field trip to visit some of these growth facilities, but you know, you're talking California, Oregon, Ontario is probably the closest one. And I have no desire to, I mean, I would, I would take a trip to Ontario. I would mind, I would not hesitate to take a road trip to Ontario. However, this time of year, no <laughs> way. <laughs> yeah, you got to go through the um, snow belt. I mean, I've been, to, I've been to Ontario. It's a great, it's a wonderful area of, of Canada. But in uh, you know this time of year, by the time I want to, by the time I do get there, this bylaw is going to have to already be submitted and you know going to town meeting. So it's going to be too late. I wish I had known about this guy, this person, six months ago. It would have been a different story. You know, drive a you know halfway up there, see a sea of whatever. Enough said. Well, some of us met last weekend and. Uh I can't speak for all of Hadley, but for those that I've met, are you know really happy with you know what you guys are putting together, and you know we, we want something we can support. And I think you know from what we've seen and looked over, it looks pretty darn close. So yeah, you know, I, I I don't get it. I don't have a sense that there's a lot of people looking at the work that's been done and saying it's not good enough and we can't support this. It's it's it's, it's the little details, and I think we all are pretty happy with it. Then. Well, go, happy go, to be unhappy. Go, go, go <laughs> to town meeting in May and vote for it. I think we will. <laughs> because that is that is the biggest thing about this. Of, you know, everybody says, yeah, we like this, we can live with it, and everything else. And you don't show up at town meeting and vote for it. You know, um, and that that's the important thing. You know, go to town meeting and make your voice heard. For or against. Hopefully yeah, the, other, the other option is to vote. Reverse the original vote and have them. Yeah, that's 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 a tantamount process project because you're going to take a town meeting vote and a ballot vote, and you need uh, well, you only need a, you need a majority of each, but uh, you know that's petitions and a whole bit and a percentage that went by how many? Well, in the state, it fifty-two percent. That was, that was close. So I don't know what was that. Any money in Well, I would be willing to bet that people knew what their vote meant yeah. at the ballot. <laughs> the vote tally would have been different. <laughs> However, it is what it is, and we passed it, <clears throat> be it by three votes or one vote or a thousand votes. It passed and Hadley. 
is what we have to live with and we need to address it. Yeah, I think Lisa Sanderson had said it was something, it wasn't, it was close. It was like 52 to 48 or something oh, like that. Yeah, yeah. But even if there were a, an organized opposition to allowing adult use growth and sales mm -hmm. in Hadley, um, that was going to be on the ballot for t or on the warrant for town meeting. We still have to have this ready to go in case that didn't go. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't they it could be reversed any point in the future? Yeah. Like that. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's like prohibition. Yeah. So um, I don't know if you want to go through any of the other comments. Um, uh, I shared this with uh, Dick Evans, who's a lawyer in Northampton, who is very um, an advocate for legalization of uh, marijuana across the board. But he also is a good land use lawyer that I've worked with. He uh, came back with a number of comments. I couldn't get that to print out with his comments. When I tried to print it out with his comments, I printed out with everybody's comments, and it was an absolute disaster. Okay. So um, I'm, doing, I'm not doing something right. I'll, I'll, I'll give you this. To be a guru. Uh, the um, some of the uh, some of these are kind of technical, and they're based. They're they're actually very helpful based on um, um, some of the ins and outs of okay. the uh, Cannabis Control Commission requirements. So some of what we are asking for, um, you said a couple of them create a catch twenty two, uh, where we're saying you have to have. Cannabis Control Commission approval before you can apply, and the Cannabis Control Commission says you have to have local local approval before you can get, be approved. So, uh, I will share this with Jim. I think some of these will be able to be worked yeah. in, but they're quite yeah. able to have yeah. the stuff. So, yeah, I, I was reading some. Of, I was able to read them because of the way they were the way the. the uh, Spreadsheet was put together, but when I tried to print them, I don't know if I it, it didn't print. Enough said. So, and I, I saw the Cat 22s list. You know, he's, he's got some like Bill says, he's got some good points. There's a lot of there's a few comments in there that I disagree with, but a lot of uh, some of the wording and stuff like that. That yeah, it makes sense to do that. And there, uh, particularly, he made a, a good point with the way we have it worded that there'll be only uh, two facilities. Uh, we meant that to mean there will only be two retail facilities, but because of how we define facilities, everything is incorporated. A grow site is a facility, so we, that's something we'll have to right. address. Well, the, the only thing about that is the town has already voted on the two limit, and that specifically re, specifically addresses retail sites. Right. But we need to make it better in our bylaws so we don't have a. Uh, uh, conflicting comments between the town and what they voted and what we have. So I'll give you mine too because I've put some check marks to be some of the things I thought were okay. more valid than and some of the most opinion. Okay. Um, except okay. this is in color. <laughs> um, so uh, again, nothing substantive in those. Uh, I think Jim will be able to work them into the next draft, which will go out. Um, but I'll give some useful points on just consistency between the bylaw, the state regulations, and internal consistency of the bylaw. The biggest thing is to add, a, you know, from what we talked about a little bit on the noise, to add a, a, a section under the uh, area where we have, you know, spells and odors to address noise because um, it'll be a disaster. I mean, noise on a hot summer day. You could probably be 100 people in the facility and not hear a noise. And a cold winter day like we have today, you could be uh, half a mile away, and that noise could be extremely um, irritating because of the way sound travels in, in hot, humid weather versus clear, clear, crisp, cold weather. And so. Like you said, the one thing about noise is it's very measurable. And then there was this comment. Oh, we got one from uh, the attorney. The attorney, right? On close to a subdivision. 
I don't know if this is even legal, Bill. That's what I was going to ask you. Do you have yeah. any idea if that's legal? We got a comment that we're allowing, we're allowing craft growers, which is a 5,000 square foot facility on a site. And one of the comments that we mentioned at one of our meetings was, well, what if somebody comes along and takes a 10 acre parcel and now divides, subdivides it into a bunch of small parcels and now you have a whole bunch of craft marijuana growers? So we tried to address it by saying craft marijuana, craft marijuana growers have to be 300 feet away from each other. That will address it to some point, but what we really like to do is, you know, put something in there that says you can't do, you can't subdivide it. And an attorney has given us a comment that we would not allow a property to be subdivided, but here it is. No marijuana cultivator, regardless of tier, uh, shall be permitted to modify, alter, or amend, or divide, or subdivide any parcel of land for the purpose of cultivating marijuana. That's a great thing, and it would, would work. What I don't know, is it legal? I, I don't know. That might be something we'll have to run by town. That council. might be illegal to simply, oh, because you're limiting how somebody can divide their property, that might not be legal. I hope it is. That would take care of a lot of our concerns. I'm just concerned that if you, if, you could, if you can legally subdivide it for other purposes, uh, we may be boxing ourselves into a corner by saying you can do it for any other purpose except for this. I think that the, um, the setbacks would still apply, so I think that addresses, you know, it gets to some of it. Uh, we might need to think about that a little bit, or maybe I will just share it with town council. Yes, ma'am? Yeah. Um, the other potential issue with that is, though, that you're saying, and if you went with this as it is, that no marijuana cultivator, whatever, can subdivide, but a, an owner could subdivide and then sell to lots of different yeah, there, there's growers or whatever. There, there so are, whether you would need to say, as of the passing of this bylaw, no parcel can be subdivided, or yeah, you know something. That, that you couldn't like do because that. now you know somebody couldn't come along and subdivide it. You know, well, for the, it, it gets into a very, you're right. It's you know, a it's a very messy, complicated situation, and although the intent sounds good. Like Joe commented many, many times, the devil's in the details. There's ways I would be sure that could be worked around this. And I think what we really need to do is go back to the setbacks between, the setback distances between craft marijuana growers. And maybe we make that something larger than 300 feet. You know, we're we gonna look at that. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I, uh, Attorney Andrew Bass, I wrote that one. Um, yeah, after the last meeting, we looked at a few parcels with a surveyor, just saw uh, some maps, and it looked like it's entirely possible it's under the current um, rules in Hadley to subdivide some of these things, and you could have um, like 50 grow houses on a tier one cultivator on some of these lots in Hadley, and it's completely le legal. I mean, there's nothing that the bylaw covers about it, and there's nothing the town regulations cover about it, and the, the requirements to subdivide them are so uh, liberal that you could, you know, you could easily do it. So, you know, I don't think that what I drafted is perfect by any means, but if there was something that could be structured, you know, then yeah. that would probably be essential to include in there. Otherwise, in that ag res uh, district, for example, this could happen where you could have 50 of these things on one, what was one parcel. Um, we fully realize that. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to wrestle. We're wrestling with how do we do that and to, without trying to box ourselves in and also not be legal, but also, I mean, we, only, we want to be legal, we have to be legal, we don't have a choice. And we also don't want to limit the uh, options of the farmer for future things. Um, I don't know. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to say that the, um, as far as I know, the, the laws stated st state that you can only hold three licenses for cultivation. So if there was a, a property that was divided into 50 different parcels, you could still only own three licenses. 
if we realize that, what we're saying is they could sell it off to other, you know, they, they could sell it off to other people so that you would still have three, everybody would still only own three, but you would probably have, up to his point, in the worst case scenario, um, 15 different groups of three owning all those pieces, okay? Now, you know, that's probably really stretching the whole theory, and I doubt that would happen. However, you may not have 50, but maybe you have 15, where you normally really would only want to have two or three. Okay. On the other hand, we, if you're going to do a, a by right division of the land, you have to have it at least be a building lot size. So you're talking 175 feet of frontage and 30,000 square feet of area. So there are parcels that could be broken up that are that big, but um, it's not like you're going to take a 10 acre parcel and cut it up 10 ways if you don't have the street frontage to support that. It's got to meet the zoning bylaws, and a lot of it will depend on how lucrative is the marijuana grow business. I mean, if it's if it's extremely lucrative, then people could get really, really creative on how they divide the properties up. If it is, you know, reasonably lucrative, and you know they're not going to start dividing the properties up. You know, who knows? We, we we can't predict that. And this is just you know out there someplace. But we're trying to at least prevent or not prevent avoid the real easy ones to be divided where they have enough frontage on the road, something like that. Could could one withdraw a subdivision plan and, and instead convert it to marijuana growth facilities? They could draw up a subdivision plan for building lots and convert that entirely into uh wait a minute the no they can't they no they can't no they can't because of the wording that was put in by mr attorney bass on the subdivision if you have a definitive subdivision approved in the resident at residential area those are residential building lots Therefore, those residential building, building lots could not be turned into grow process parcels because the, sub, because the bylaw says that you need to be away 300, if we change it to 300, I'm right any approved definitive subdivision, and that that is on file with the registry of deeds, so they couldn't, they couldn't break it up into residential well, lots. You know, all we're thinking about is North Hadley. What about Lawrence Plain and that street that's been put in and nobody has never sold a lot there? They, they could not. That is an approved subdivision that is on file in the okay. registry of okay. deeds, and that cannot be converted okay. into, built into uh, grow lots. Sort of a catch-22 on setbacks. Yes. What, what if somebody bought five of those I, lots? I, 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 would, I, would, I would say that we're all set on this. You know, I, I suppose We're almost all set. Theoretically, someone could come into us with a non-residential subdivision uh, in a business district or the industrial district, and put they asked to put in a street and uh, with say hypothetically ten lots off of it. Um, however, we have under the subdivision regulations we have. The, we can impose the requirements of a commercial street, of a business That's street. Right, there. Right. That street is going to cost five hundred dollars a foot. Yeah. The, the, yeah. the I mean, I, I. The only thing we we would need to be concerned with is a very long approval, not required building lots. And by long, I mean something that meets frontage, but it's very deep um, to divide them up. Those exist, I'm not going to deny it. But there's a few places in Hadley that those would be allowed. Um, South Maple Street is one that comes to mind. There's a lot of open fields out there that has a lot of frontage and the lots, the Wests and the Cooks have very deep lots. APR. Um, that's true, there's APR out there too. But there's, there's not, I don't think the concern is as big as we think about because 
the first wording that Mr. Uh, attorney, like I said, Attorney uh, Bass recommended, and where we've already incorporated it about the setbacks of an approved definitive subdivision. If, you, if, it's, if it's already been done, then somebody can't come in in the ag residential district and say, well, we're going to divide this into, you know, 20 building lots. Well, good, 300 feet back from each of them. Yes, sir. Well, I, I think uh, having drafted that, I might caution on that because uh, that's, it only applies to things on record, right, at the time of the bylaw enactment. So if they come in afterwards and then divide it, they can still divide it. It's just, that would only apply to something on record already that's already been divided. Um, so we well, change it. I think we could change we it. Could, that's easy enough to change them on record to simply at the time of application. So. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. I did have uh, one other question, and I'm probably done for the night. But um, did Richard Evans address setbacks at all in his uh, pointers of things that he found to be catch 22s or anything? Uh, not, not per se. It was, it was the, he had some ge more general comments about how. Uh, uh, wh why are you having such big setbacks? Um, but um, that I, I put that aside as sort of a, a commentary, um, as opposed to pointing out some real catch twenty twos and internal inconsistencies. So we seem to. I, I'll try to remember to send you what he his comments so you can take a look Thank at you. them. Okay. So are we, are we going to hold one more hearing like this before we have a definitive work done? Or yeah, I, I think we want to. I think we want to make the changes that we're, we were talking about. They're not great. Okay. Um, and we need to get this to town council, not town council. Oh. Yeah. Well, we can we can start sending it to Joel to town council. Oh, we, we can send town council. I'm talking Anytime. about. We need Let's to get, get it out. We need to get to. Uh, I think we, we need to get placeholders to uh, David Nixon by the 13th, how many zoning bylaws we're going to have. And I mean, we sometimes we've given him the zone bylaw a month before town meeting, just so it could be published in the, uh, yeah. the warrant. So we've got some time to actually get the finished product to David. Um, I would think maybe after you get your next draft, we want to give it to Joel. I want to give it to Joel to take a look at. Yes. Uh, Joel Barr, our town council. Um, um, I did uh, speak with or emailed with our new Pioneer Valley Planning Commission representative. He actually asked if we wanted him to come tonight. I said I didn't think that would be necessary. Um, so functionally, we try to break up our our month by using the first Tuesday of the month for planning activities and the third Tuesday of the month for the permitting side of things. Um, which So tonight was kind of a hybrid because there was no first Tuesday um, of January. He will be able to join us on February 5th. Okay. Uh, I did ask him to uh, be up to, as much up to speed as he could be on MS4, yes. which is a massive uh, anti-pollution drainage control initiative that the state thinks all the towns along the Connecticut River should jump in on. So we're under pressure to have a, a, another area of bylaws developed for Springtown meeting. I think we can probably bring this up on February 5th as well, but um, well, right now, on the 19th, all we go to the fire station. I honestly don't think that's going to be a monster type consumer. I bet we could probably take that up, and I doubt that'll take more than about 45 minutes. Yeah. You know, um, it's simply a whole lot more clearer because they don't have a parking problem, they don't have a drainage problem. We'll raise some concerns about ask questions about the drainage, but if they are, if they design it for a, at least a 25 year storm, you know, they should be in good. They've, they've, they've tested, usually, um, they design for a 100 year storm. 
Once yes. again, though, Jim, this, this bothers me. You have this huge parcel of land that the town bought, and you're going to have this little auxiliary fire station plumped right in the middle with no plan for overall okay. drainage, all this that, That's not a zoning issue. I mean, issue. that's not a zoning issue, but it is an issue that I'm yeah. going to address yeah. because all right. there is no plan. Well, we have got a, a building committee. That we have a scheduling issue for right now. Yeah, we've got to get through that. Um, I don't mind taking this up on, I don't mind taking adult marijuana up on the 5th as well, along with MS4. Yeah, MS4 is not going to be a corker. That is, MS4 will be a, will be a large technical block of stuff, but it's basically stuff we're being told we have to do anyway. Yeah, so, so that, that, that's, that's a, you're right, that's a lot, that's very clear cut because the state says you have to do this. We just it's not want, negotiable. Yeah, we just want to be sure that we have something ready to go. So yes. we need to review okay, that for so more. But, I agree. But we can do this um, on the uh, on the fifth as well. And this uh, January is a five Tuesday month, so that's actually three weeks away. Did yes. the legislature vote that we had to do this, or was it? It's a already. It's already a DEP. D it, was, D it was a dictate. It was a dictate. It's a dictated. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's already um, being utilized by the state. The state is, the state is already, uh, uh, how would I say this, made MS4 effective as of, I think, late last year. So you had no say about this. Yes. A no bureaucrat say. told you you had to do this. This is called taxation without representation. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, a, that's yeah. It's very similar to what they're trying to do with, I think, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if this floodplain is, is tied into MS4 somehow, Joe. I would, I think you're absolutely correct. Well, so. just for the audience, the floodplain is being adjusted, and you may even be in the floodplain, but what they want to do is expand the floodplain so they can get more people paying into the federal flood insurance program. It's a, it's a subtle way he's shaking his head and knowing because they're running out of money, or they don't have enough money to, to fund. So that's a whole other story. The, the current before, before we close it up, these people may be interested in what I was going to be commenting about. Okay, so let, let me talk to you okay. a little bit about the, the flood thing. Just as a, as a little bit further information on that, Joe and I attended, and several others in town, David Nixon among them, um, a seminar, a public, public information system. One was at the Jones Library, actually two in the Jones Library, and there was two others around in Springfield, the Holy Cross, I forgot where they were. And they, right now, the, the floodplain maps are basically 1950s, 60s vintage paper maps. And they want to put, update the floodplain maps and digitize them. Well, that's great. However, um, because they have preliminary taken the paper maps and overlaid the new proposed uh, floodplains on them that I have no idea where they got these information from. And they've done it town by town, virtually along the Connecticut River and in other areas of the state, wherever there is a river that'll flood, which is obviously is practically every city or town within the state because of the number of rivers. The Connecticut River is a big one and it affects us and every other town right near us. Currently, and I know this from when we were building and designing the new elementary school, or the elementary school, I would say the new, it's just 20 something years old now. We took elevations, Randy Iser and I, and Randy's the engineer, I was just holding up the stick. And we took a whole bunch of elevations around Hopkins. And the only areas around Hopkins that were within the flood zone, which is 125 foot level at that section of town, is the ball fields at Russell School, the Hopkins ball fields, but virtually the entire parking lot and where the old gym was are not in the floodplain. Hopping does not in the floodplain, and nothing here is in the floodplain. It's all above 125. The banks are not in the floodplain. The new floodplain maps show all of this in the floodplain. Hopkins, Hopkins is raised up, good Lord, 
10 feet above the floodplain. And likewise, all of the, you know, the Holy Redeemer Church and all the, all the areas around it, and, the, and, and they, 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 in the center of town, much of this is in the floodplain. You go out to where a lot of you live, not so much on Shattuck Road, but in uh, Cold Springs Lane, you're barely out of the floodplain. So you can just imagine how much area has been added there. And you go up along um, 116 where Meadow Street is, and, uh, and uh, Meadow Street, and Roosevelt Street, and not Meadow Street, Meadow Street and Amherst, Roosevelt Street and Hadley and stuff like that. That's almost all in a floodplain now. And all the fields out towards 116. My mother grew up in that area. She said, that didn't even flood in 36. <laughs> so we're working with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and was, we notified, we told the state at our meeting, you know, this is wrong. Well, they don't disagree with that. They says, well, we've got to somehow research this and find out what's really correct. Well, how do we do that? They didn't have a good answer. So working with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, you know, Obviously, surveying the town is not a reasonable thing, but how do we address this? And so, we, and luckily, this is not something that's going to be done any right now. This is a five-year plan at the earliest that we need to get this uh, get this addressed. So we have some time, but we can't do nothing and wait for four years and say, "Oh, we now have to do something." So we're trying to get going on it now, even realizing it's probably going to take. A considerable amount of research. Okay, go ahead, Bill. Go, Joe, with your. Uh, okay, uh, I'm the representative from the planning board to the CPA Community Preservation Act, and we presented to us last night uh, was the request for the APR for the Shala property, which is uh, partly on Shattuck Road all the way. So that's. Uh, a pro it's 170 acres off Cummins Road and Shattuck Road, and the uh, projected cost is $720,000. APR is going to be funding the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture will fund half, $360,000. The only reason they don't have a federal matching yet, so that's why they are only contributing half. Now the other 50% is coming from the uh, CPA, the Community Preservation Act, which we'll have a chance to vote on it at the town meeting. But the, the most important part from the planning board perspective is TDR, the Transfer of Development Rights. A few years ago, the planning board said that if you do not have enough parking in the business zone, you can buy your way out. Maybe extortion, but nevertheless, you can put some money aside for exactly a situation like this, buying more agricultural land. And the custodian of this money is the Conservation Commission. So they're the ones that are going to be requesting it. But for this parcel, uh, the uh, percentage will be 21% or 150000 from the TDR that was set aside. So kind of good news for something that we occasionally stumble into the right direction. Okay, so we'll continue this uh, marijuana discussion to February 5th, and uh, okay, hopefully we'll have just about finalized by then. Um, let's see, other business. We did get a letter. There is uh, a building lot on, Shmo on uh, Lawrence Plain Road that was recently did under contract to be sold, and there was a bulldozer out there. What? A week ago, Mike, a week and a half ago, right. moving, the, moving the topsoil around, and they since brought in a significant amount of fill. And that's the one next to the flag lot, um, just down the road from the spice plant. You know what I'm talking about? Remember when put the flag lot in, it was way back, and the road was flooding by David Chamorro's house there? Yep. But, but to the, just to the uh, north of where, uh, um, across the street from where uh, Mike Kostick used to live. Mm hmm we have a letter from two na a neighbor, um, David and Rebecca Chamura, to the planning board, 
and is dated today, we are concerned with the amount of fill being brought in for the lot for the lot next to us. We have had problems with water flooding part of our land in the past when a flag lot was put in. We have notified we notified the planning board then. We would like it noted that it is a concern for us now. David called me today about this and I told him that, you know, really the planning board can't do has no say on an approval not required lot if they're filling something in. That's really an issue between uh, landowners if there is a flooding occurring unless there's a conservation issue at the current time. And he's well, I doubt there's a conservation issue because there's really no wetlands near them or anything like that. And he said he just making this letter to us basically just for the record so that somebody's been alerted of that there's a concern. I think it's more of a kind of CYA in case down the road something happens. So I was going to make a copy of this and put it into the uh, building inspector's mailbox and the conservation commission. Yep. There's really nothing else from it's a private landowner. It's an approval not required lot. The right, the part of the filling is right up against the road going out to the flag lot that had some concerns when they put it in a couple of several years ago. So I says that we're we're very limited of what we can do. Oh, town report. I put that out. For review, anybody have any comments on it? Good job. That's fine. <laughs> if, if it was a I didn't read it either. <laughs> yeah, right. I read it. <laughs> oh, we did get our annual acknowledgement of a summary of the conflict of interest law. Did you guys fill it out and mail it and, and, and uh, put it into the town clerk's mailbox? No. No. You want to sign no, it that says you got a copy? Don't you have to do the ethics thing every two years, though? Year or every year or every two years. Every two years. Yeah, yeah, I think I just did it last year. Yeah, just. Yeah, yeah we did it. Yeah, we can sign out. I'll, I'll put it in her mailbox and we'll be covered. I put mine in today. I, I send to the select, but the thing is same old, same old. But And we have no bills. Good. Do you have anything else, Bill? I don't have anything else. Move, we adjourn. Wait Second. a minute, let's finish this <laughs> first. Second. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, we got some stuff here. Oh, that's just getting more information. There probably is a Piney Valley Planning Commission calendar in there. Yeah. Is that what that is? Yeah. Oh, nice. I didn't know if I'm done. Okay. They want a calendar? calendar? Short one? Quick one? Okay, we have motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Meetings, history, thank you, and thank you, John.